Uh, I'd now like to invite our keynote speaker, uh, Tom Welton, to, to, to speak. We're really lucky to have uh, Tom with us this evening. Uh, he's president of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK uh, and professor of sustainable chemistry at Imperial, uh, Imperial College London. Uh, and he has long worked uh, to advocate for greater visibility for LGBTQIA plus people. Uh, and it's my pleasure for, to ask him to, uh, to present and uh, give us a, a short keynote speech this evening about his, his work and views. So please, Tom, if, if you're ready. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much, much for joining us. So I'll just share the screen, that one, and from the beginning. It seems to be taking a while to get from the beginning. Okay. Um, so before I start, let, let me um, make some comments that have come out of the, the previous presentation. And one of them is uh, a piece of good news. And that is, well, we at the RSC, but also Elsevier, of course, who are a major international um, publisher, have now enacted policies where um, trans people can use their current name and have their dead name removed from uh, previous publications. And so um, I think that that should be welcomed. And also, I, I wasn't particularly going to talk about it today. So one of the reports that I, you, you might find on, on the links is the report from us at the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Institute of Physics and the Royal Society of Astronomers um, on being LGBT plus in the um, physical sciences. And this will come through as a theme in my talk. And yes, we saw many of the kind of issues that um, uh, were raised in the previous talk. But what I would say for me, which was really stark, really, really, really stark, was regardless of one's identity, that people who were open and out about their identity reported happier results across every question than those who were not. And, you know, really significantly, 10% more, 20% more. So very much um, people were reporting a happier time in, in physical sciences if they were open about their identity. And so, to, yeah, I was asked to talk a little bit about my career um, and how I ended up uh, getting here um, and to talk about my science, but also to talk a, a little bit about myself. And, and of course, I didn't think that I would, I'm of course talking to um, people for whom the word boner might be a complete mystery. I won't go into that, look it up. It's a thing called Polare, have a look and um, you'll learn something about LGBT history in the English speaking world. So I'm Tom Welton, OBE, Professor of Sustainable Chemistry and President of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And as you can see by me walking on fire in a bright pink sweatshirt, I am quite out. And, and so I'd like to, to start here. And so when I, I studied at the University of Sussex, we'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. And here are the people that were there who were fellows of the Royal Society. So that's members of the National Science Academy here in the UK. You can see they're a pretty homogeneous bunch, you know, but they were all skillful. They were all talented. They were all very clever. They were all, they were all intelligent. And one of the problems that I had with this was all of those, all of those words, you can too easily put the word naturally before it. So naturally skillful, naturally clever. And so therefore naturally destined for success. And so for the first time today, we hear the phrase imposture syndrome. There was no way these that I could envisage myself as being one of these naturally destined for success people when I first arrived 
at Sussex University. And I would go on to say that, you know, the whole of this idea of imposter syndrome, one of the things for me about it is it's based on a lie. It is based on the lie that there is anything natural about the undoubted success that these people had. So not wishing to um, delve into to their careers, I'm going to tell you a little bit of mine, and I'm going to tell you for real, you know, not my CV, not the here are the highlights, here are the top things that I want you to know, and here is me presenting myself as the most, you know, wonderfully brilliant chemist that you could possibly imagine. I'm going to talk to you about the reality of what happened. So very simply, um, it all started here, and so the, the picture at the top is literally of the block of flats in which I was born. I wasn't born in a hospital, I was born at home. And this was on a North London uh, council estate, so um, uh, social housing. And I was born on the eighth floor of that block of flats. I went to uh, a very conventional uh, primary school, which was you know, just the local school, the one which was the shortest walk um, from that block of flats. And then I went to secretary school, which in spite of the picture was not at Hogwarts. It was at a, um, a grammar school. So an educationally selective, but state run school. I then you know, progressed through um, my uh, studies there and started to apply for university. And here in the UK, we have a competitive, we have competitive everything here in the UK, have a competitive application system where you apply for a number of universities, you get um, accepted with a provisional offer. So if you were to get these grades in your A levels, you can come and study here. And I chose the University of Bristol at that time, well, and still now, one of the leading chemistry departments in the UK. However, I did not get the A-level grades that were necessary to meet my offer. And in fact, I ended up going to the University of Sussex, which was my second choice uh, university. I have to say that this was the luckiest thing that has happened in my entire career of failing to get into my first class, uh, my first choice university. Um, but I arrived at Sussex, and again, having turned up there feeling a bit of a failure, again, that imposter syndrome raised its ugly head. And then I eventually went on and studied um, uh, there. I did not get a first class degree. I did not get top marks. I was not the best in my year. I was an okay, reasonably good student and graduated in 1985 with my 2-1. And then I needed to look around the place. And so here's where I first want to start talking a little bit about the 1980s, looking around me for um, any kind of LGBT uh, scientist role model. There was nothing. Now, there may have been happy, confident, out, LGBT plus professors around the country, that may have happened. In retrospect, looking back, no, there weren't back then. But also there was no way to know about them. There was no internet, there was no social media. They didn't have Wikipedia pages because Wikipedia didn't exist. And so it was a total void, a complete absence. And I want to talk to you a bit about how I dealt with that and to think about Actually, what we mean by role models, yes, it is, you know, very, very helpful to be able to see yourself in the future because you can see somebody who looks like you, feels like you, who has already advanced through. But what do you do if you can't see that person? Do you just abandon your hopes of having a career in science and say, because I can't see that person, it can't happen for me. What am I going to do? So the first thing, so the University of Sussex is in, in a town called Brighton. 
And back there in the 1980s, this was one of the really lucky things that happened, was that, you know, there were three, maybe four towns in the world where, um, uh, you know, a gay couple could walk down the road hand in hand without being frightened that they would be attacked. One of those towns was San Francisco. One of those towns was Amsterdam. And one of those towns was Brighton. So in fact, there were role models all around me. Brighton was a very open town. You know, as I say, lesbians, gay people walked the streets holding hands, were seen and visible. They were part of the local community. There were role models everywhere. I didn't need to think, oh, all aspects of myself have to be reflected in one person. Happy, out, confident gay people were around me everywhere. I would also like to talk about this person in particular. So this person's called John Curry. And John Curry, I'm shocked that John Curry isn't an internationally famous LGBT plus hero, uh, because he certainly deserves to be. And here's a picture of him um, and a YouTube link. I, I recommend you go and look and see that the amazing sportsman that John Curry was. And in, indeed, you can see him in the picture here with his gold medal from the 1976 Winter Olympics. So why am I talking about John Curry? So in the um, early 70s, he had been the UK um, uh, figure, men's figure skating champion for um, some time. And he had been getting better and better and better on the international stage. And in the winter over 1975 to 1976, he became the European the, uh, and the world champion. And then eventually the Olympic men's figure skating champion. He brought into his sport a combination of not only his exceptional technical skills and athleticism, but he brought ballet into his performance. And I have to say, he would probably have been a champion a lot earlier if he had not, because it was really not popular. And he was often described as being too flamboyant, um, particularly in the more technical elements of the competition. But he won the European Championships and then a German newspaper outed him as a gay man. And it was a very thinly veiled attempt at bullying um, in order to destabilize him it, so that his great success would not continue on. But John Curry didn't allow himself to be bullied. He didn't allow himself to be cowed. He spoke very openly about being gay and said, well, yes, of course I am. What did you think? And he went on to win the competition. So he, he overcame the bullying. He then, we have a thing here in the UK, the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. And I think I want to draw this out because it is voted for by the British public. And as an out gay man, he was then voted BBC, BBC Sports Personality of the Year back in 1976. We somehow imagine that, well, even in sport today, very few active sports people are out during um, their careers. Many of them come out afterwards, but very few of them are out during the, This man was doing this back in 1976. He then went on to, the, to a highly successful professional skating career. And so of course he was a role model for me. He was somebody who had really overcome the challenges that were placed before him, the obstacles that were placed before him and the bullying that was attempted to him. So here's another role mo model of mine. And so this is a picture of my PhD super supervisor. Um, he has now sadly passed, um, but he was 
um, a lecturer at the University of Sussex at that time. His name was Ken Seddon. And Ken had many flaws. Ken could be rude, he could be dismissive, he could be all sorts of different things. But he absolutely believed, and not because of political correctness or, or any kind, in fact, he was very, almost anti-politics. He absolutely believed that the only thing that was important about someone is how talented and committed they were to chemistry. <laughs> and that that was not defined by any identity that the person might have, what their sex was, what their gender was, what their race was, what their sexuality was. He just like, don't be ridiculous. How can your ability as a chemist have anything to do with that kind of stuff? And I worked in a research group with him during my PhD where, you know, it was about 50-50 male-female, for instance. And we did not think that that was strange. We thought that the lab on the opposite side of the corridor, which was entirely composed of men, we thought that was strange. And so Ken really did, not just for us, but he then became the leader of um, the field of ionic liquids. He belief in this was so strong that actually he role modeled it across the field, across the world. The, the ionic liquids field is extremely welcoming to LGBT plus people as it is to people of all identities, because he stood as that role model of that stuff does not determine whether you should be valued in this community. It's something else. And so a great role modeling. And now you wanted some chemistry. So uh, with Ken, this was the the second great piece of luck, well, actually the third great piece of luck. The second great piece of luck was Harry Croto, who was doing the work at the time that led to him getting a, a Nobel Prize, was my physical chemistry tutor. That was a great piece of luck. Would never have happened at the University of Bristol. The third great piece of luck was bumping into Ken and discovering these things called ionic liquids. So what is an ionic liquid? If you take a salt, and you heat it up, eventually it will melt. That liquid is made up entirely of ions. For sodium chloride, it melts at 801 degrees. That's not a lot of use to anybody. And so I work on, first of all, trying to reduce the melting point of salts. And you can do that. And here are some ions that, um, if you use any combination of these cations, either of these cations with these anions, you will get a salt that doesn't melt at 801 degrees, it melts below room temperature. And so that liquid, a room temperature ionic liquid, is really quite useful. And you can look at either its own properties, use it as a solvent for chemical reactions. We do work where we um, process biomass um, for chemicals and fuels using ionic liquids. They become chemically useful. Right, so let's get back to me. And so I did my PhD at the University of Sussex. I did some postdocing there. And then I went to the University of Exeter where another very lucky thing happened to me. I met the person who is now my husband. Yay! And what I want to tell you about this, so the, I was there for a two year position. It was a temporary post. And I was interviewed for that position by this man here, Eddie Abel, Professor Eddie Abel, I should say. And at the end of the interview, we were, talking and he was and he was saying you know if we offered this job to you would you accept it and I said I you know would need to come down and see Exeter with my partner um and see you know what it would you know what it would be like to be there and he said oh what does she do to which of course I replied he is an electronic engineer Ed then went back to the department 
and ran round the department the following day saying, oh my God, oh my God, I've appointed a gay man. I don't know, oh, what should we do? Oh, I've, you know. And, and luckily, Julia, who had been a student with me at Sussex was there, sat him down and calmed him down and said, look, he's very nice, <laughs> it, it, it'll all be fine. And why do I know that Ed did that? The reason I know that Ed did that is done that. And what he said at the end of the two years was, I did this, I was in a panic, it was, I didn't know what to do. And of course, what I now realise was that was totally stupid. And I would be more than happy to employ a gay man again. So here, I think there are two role models. There's the role model of Eddie Abel, who was willing to change his mind, willing to learn, willing to be open. But there was also the role model of Tom Welton, who was showing that, well, all the stuff that Ken Seddon had believed, that um, I was a good chemist, I was a friendly and helpful colleague. I, one of my jobs was to organize um, the departmental parties at Christmas and Midsummer and all of that kind of thing. I was the person that had heard that Ed was a fan of what you might call cheap German white, sweet white wine. And I would always make sure when we had a party that Ed knew that there were a couple of bottles of this awful stuff tucked under the table for him. I was a good colleague. And so we were both role models. And that's something that I want you to think about. You know, what kind of role model are you? Not just uh, people who are younger than you, but they will be, you know, those of you that are Postdocs will have PhD students looking at you. Those of you the PhD students will have undergraduates looking at you. Those of you the undergraduates will have school children looking at you thinking that person is the success that I want to be. Every single one of you has somebody looking up to you thinking that's the person that's the person that's doing the thing that I want to do. Have you ever asked yourself whether the behaviours that you are modelling are the behaviours that you would like to see. Because if you're not, how do you expect the person looking at you to display those behaviours? They're going to look at you and they're going to say, oh, this is what I need to do to succeed. This is how I need to behave. This is how you get on in this place. Are you modeling the behaviors that you would like to see? Back to the University of Exeter and my CV, you know, unfortunately during my time there, I applied for independent fellowships. I failed at three of them. I applied for lectureships. I failed, I had 12 interviews and didn't get the job. But eventually I did. And um, in 1993, I became the Lloyds of London Tercentenary Research Fellow at Imperial College. And so that's it. I'm at Imperial College. I was given a promise of a lectureship. You know, I've made it. That, I don't have to worry anymore. I've made it. It took until 1999 until I got my first major grant, having had eight previous Research Council proposals rejected. And what was I doing? Back to the science. I was in, in search of an ionic liquid effect. So we got these liquids and I wanted to know, was there something that was unique about them? So was there some phenomenon that I could find that was not just quantitatively different in ionic liquids, but qualitatively different in ionic liquids? It would have to be observed in all ionic liquids, or at least the vast majority of them, and not solid, salty even, because otherwise it wouldn't be a phenomenon that comes uniquely for ionic liquids. And it would have to be um, that it arose because the liquid was composed of ions in motion, a liquid um, of ions. The answer is yes. <laughs> Thank the Lord. 
Um, and here are some um, papers that um, really launched my career in a big way. Actually, in 1999, the, in, my impact on the field wasn't launched by a research paper, it was launched by a review paper, which still has, you know, 12,000 citations. But what I'd like to point out here is that the, the, some of the people who are, are highlighted, and, you know, these are just some of the great people that I've worked with. So my work on Suzuki reactions with Paul Smith, Paul Smith was a student who was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant and did fantastic work and was a pleasure to work with. Brent Young was a colleague who was willing uh, back then. So I did, I have ended up doing a lot of work on kinetics. I knew nothing about kinetics back then, but my great colleague Brent Young was willing to spend time teaching me how to do kinetics and how to get the best out of kinetics. My two great theoretician friends, um, Patricia Hunt and Barbara Kirkner, you know, my, my work has been absolutely transformed by my collaborations with these two great female um, theoreticians, and they have helped me make advances that would never have been made. And finally, the last person that I'm highlighting here, um, Aggie Brandt, who's a more recent um, uh, PhD student of mine, who launched the spin-out company of which I'm one of the founding directors. So these amazing people that I've worked with. And so building collaborations with people that have skills and experiences that you don't um, is a really vital way of making yourself more successful. So what is and what makes a, um, a successful career? Well, I think being president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, quite I tops it out, having 150 papers with an H index of 71. As I said, I have a review article with now 12,000 citations. I was one of the first people to receive an advanced investigator award, and I have an OBE for my work on diversity in education. My CV looks fantastic. That is undoubtedly a successful career. So the message is an, uh, not woe is me, is it, you know, wasn't it all so difficult? It was every successful person experiences failure along the way. So do not give up because failure along the way does not prevent you from ending up where you might like to be. But there is no doubt that it is difficult. You're attempting to do something. I, you know, I used an example of um, an athlete, an ice skater before, a gold medal winning um, Olympian. When you're saying, I want to be the best person that's doing this particular research, that is the level that you are aiming at. It is not easy. It should not be easy. It, it is highly competitive. It can be difficult. You will work much harder and longer than most people. You will have to get used to constant rejection and frequent failures. And so it is not a course to be taken lightly. However, I have met and worked with the most amazing, amazing people. I get to make a positive difference to other people's lives. I follow my own interests. And OK, apart from the last 18 months, I have traveled to the most fabulous places. And so a successful career is happy. <laughs> that is where success really lies. It's great to have all of the other stuff, but really success for me lies in happiness. And so with that, I have to say some thank yous. Um, and acknowledge, you know, all of the role models that I've had in my career, and there are many more than I've spoken to you about today, my mentors and my supporters, my colleagues and friends, my collaborators around the world, the co-workers that I've had, and of course, most of all, the fantastic students that I've had the pleasure and privilege to work with. So with that, oh, do you have any questions? I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Tom, for a really wonderful talk. Uh, 
while people are thinking of questions, which I guess can be both about uh, everything you've talked about, including uh, chemistry, uh, 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 maybe I'll just echo what you said about on your your side about the upsides of, uh, of of the career. I really have enjoyed working with the most amazing, uh, diverse people uh, as a physicist, and it's the biggest pleasure of mine, kind of as a and as I end the early career phase of my life and enter kind of mid career phase and start getting to kind of develop a group of really interesting uh, and heterogeneous people to work with and, and whose skills complement each other. Uh, so we have one question already in the Q&A. So please, if anyone else wants to ask, put something in the Q&A, then go ahead. Uh, so uh, the um, question is uh, that if people, uh, regarding people being happier if they're out, which this person very much believes, do they think, do you think that it's, uh, part of that is that the people are already in an environment where they feel safe coming out? Um, I, think it, I think it works both ways. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, again, in the, in the first, we talked about the effort people go into to cover their identity. And one of the things that I say about myself is I'm not out. What I am is bloody obvious. And, and in order not to be out, I would have to put a huge, huge, huge amount of energy in pretending to not be me. And when I was a student at Sussex, surrounded by all those other people in Brighton, I just thought, I'm not doing that. What a waste of time and energy. I would rather put my energies into being a really successful scientist. I would rather put my energies into being a really you know, nice person. And so actually the, the coming out, the process of coming out, you know, I think can be more or less difficult for, for different people in different circumstances, but it is a liberation. It is absolutely, the, the reason why back in the 1970s it was called gay liberation is because coming out is a liberation. And even in more difficult circumstances, I mean, there are parts of the world in which this would not be true, but you know, here in Europe, it is happier being on the other side of having done that. The fear of coming out, the fear of what people's reactions may be. And you know, and I think we are very often disingenuous to our heterosexual colleagues in that we think all the time, before we come out, we think all, all about how bad their reaction might be. Whereas what we should be thinking about is how good their reaction might be, because for the vast majority of them, that is what it is. And so I think feeling, you know, if you wait till the day where you feel 100% safe, you will never do it. Being brave is part of it. And I have always found that, you know, the way I treat being out, like I say, I think of myself as obvious, you know, I didn't, I didn't in the interview of that job for Exeter to say to, to Ed, I'm a gay man. But as soon as he said something which was not true, what was her name, I just, I supplied his name as a matter of fact. And, and that's kind of the outness that I've always had, just being me. And, and I think with that, you know, certainly with that kind of outness, People appreciate it about you. People, okay, I'll tell you a little story about my job that I got at the University of uh, uh, Imperial College, which I found very, very pe pe peculiar. I was having, uh, Ed was very supportive. I was going for an interview at, in, at Imperial College and he said to me, just look honest. I thought, what a bizarre thing to say. And and, you know, not be honest, not just be yourself, you know, all those things that mentors say, just be yourself. He didn't say that. He said, just look honest. And yeah, I went to the interview again. Something got said. I, you know, I came out in the interview. And what I discovered later was the job I had applied for was who had been making up results had been doing fraudulent research. And, and actually, I think in that situation, my coming out in that mid, so we're in 1993, the world isn't as open as it is now. It was not completely closed, but the, I think that group of people who are interviewing me having just had to sack a liar and a cheat, 
thought if he is willing to be that honest about himself in this meeting when it might damage his chances of getting this job, he's actually the one we want. Because <laughs> we want someone who we know will be honest. And so, you know, it can have such positive impacts, not just, you know, be willing to accept that the people that you are with are also fantastic people. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, so one has asked about uh, the idea of a shadow CV, so where one lists one's <laughs> failures uh, and, and, and rejected funding applications. I have to say mine would be as long as my I'd say mine, uh, mine uh, would be uh, huge. Uh, I mean, I've just shown you the low lights. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so I do, I do give a talk, which um, often I talk about this and that element of my of my career making the point that um you know we're not we're not successful people aren't omnipotent it was diff it was difficult and it's a, like i said you're attempting to do something which is incredibly difficult when you're saying i want to be a world leading scientist in the area of whatever it is that's a difficult thing You've got to expect not every step along the way is going to be a glittering success. And, and so I do talk to people about it. Do you, do you think it's a, it's a risk that it might uh, uh, give the impression that somebody this the questions about whether that makes an, are you, an early career researcher I, seem uh, yeah, I would I would not do it as an early career researcher. I think it is incumbent upon those of us that are older and at the end of our career where we can do it with good humor and just point it out but you know it's not going to damage our future then you know it's our job to do that to show to you know younger people that we're not we're not what we might be perceived to be in that kind of omnipotent way we're not and, and it, so yeah so to, if you're if you're a phd student do not start bandishing around your alternative CV just yet would be my advice. But for people that are already professors and, you know, I think we should. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, and uh, I, I, I try to do that with everyone I, I, I hear about, I, I talk to, I try my best to be open about my failures. Uh, so as another uh, one British person to another, there's this uh, question which has come up about the intersection of LGBTQI plus and class in Britain. Uh, so yeah, that, I think yeah, again, as somebody who is from the UK but now no longer lives in it, is uh, I, I can see I get this asked this question quite a lot. So, so uh, maybe maybe what are your so perspectives from? So my experience from... is, I think very very honestly, I can say being a gay man has not in any way adversely affected my career. I really can see no evidence for it at all. However, being from a working class background on more than one occasion has been difficult, whether it's, um, you know, having the cultural capital at times in my life when, you know, I didn't have an uncle who could give me an internship at the bank that he worked. I didn't, you know, none of, you know, so lack of cultural capital, but also people at times, you know, literally I had an experience recently uh, during my time as dean where uh i had a new boss who would talk in latin and make jokes in latin in meetings and i eventually had to just say to him you know didn't do latin at my school you know that this it it's, it's almost like it's like a kind of microaggression isn't it it's an exclusion what we're going to do is we will just assume that you come from this kind of background. So I don't have a, I don't have a very heavy accent. I, you know, I sound like I come from London, of course, but I don't have a, I don't sound like I'm a, a, a person on EastEnders, you know. And, and so, yeah, people making these assumptions about your class background and really quite wanting to keep you out. And, and I think it's, you know, here in the UK, it's it's kind of ex it's still it's still acceptable to be dismissive of people from working class backgrounds, 
in a way that, I mean, it still happens, but it is not acceptable to exclude people based on other criteria. Sad. That's, that's really unfortunate to hear. And I think actually it's not, uh, uh, even though Finland has seen some sort of like power base for equality, we still have issues with that as well. I, I know of many uh, first generation uh, students who are starting their PhDs uh, or finish university as the first member of their families to, to go to university and from very much working class backgrounds who, who maybe don't uh, have the kind of hidden, have not been, don't have the hidden yeah. curriculum experience of like, what do you do and how, you know, how do you do these things? What forms do you fill in? Who can you ask for, for help? So these questions do resonate here in Finland as well, even if it uh, maybe, maybe to the outside seems like some sort of uh, fantasy land where everything is perfect, because it's, it's really not. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see through the lens of, of the backgrounds also and, and how these things uh, work and, and uh, happen to those of us who, who are from the UK or, or lived in the UK. Like, uh, class is class is not absent from other societies. It's just that in the UK we're quite open about I think uh, how it is, and it it has particularly it is particularly profound how it affects us. Uh, I think we don't have any other uh, questions. Uh, there at the moment, one, one and I think we're running. There's one more. Uh, I will put in the Q and A one second. Okay. All right. Now got it. Allies. Um. Well, I think allies are. are, are, are it's a kind of interesting thing, isn't it? The there's a point at which I'm kind of, hang on, don't you mean, you know, a half decent human being? You know, what, what, uh, <laughs> that's what I expect. And I expect it of everybody, not just of a small group of people who call themselves allies. Um, having said that, the reality of the world is there are some people who, who like to, be positive allies. And what I would say to them is, it's not about you, it's about us. And so your number one job is to listen. Your number two job is to learn. And your number three job is to support. But also, Looks like we might have lost Tom's connection. <laughs> Let's see if we get. Okay. Well, it looks like we've, we've sadly, I think uh, we've had to. Oh, have we got to oh, tell me about I had, yeah. a, I had a, a local internet failure from. I was talking about uh, Julia Higgins and allyship. And so I was uh, this time a still a lecturer, just about, you know, at a similar stage, no longer the, the young starter out, but um, consolidating my career. And I was asked to coordinate a, um, a proposal for a catalysis center at Imperial College. And the four big proposers were going to be these four big professors of catalysis. Um, I did a huge amount of work in there. I mean, I put ideas into it. I did all the donkey work of writing the proposal, all of that kind of stuff. And we got to the stage where the proposal was ready to be um, submitted and I was called to well not called to me we were having one of our regular meetings and one of the I have to say male professors um, said to me well Tom you need to understand this is a very political thing and to maximize the success of this proposal it should only go in from people from the four professors and your name will not be on it as one of the investigators. I was just, I was, you know, crushed. I was, I, I just, and I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't expect to be the, the principal investigator. You, you're not even going to put my name on it. And Julia Higgins 
who they obviously hadn't had the conversation with before, said, if you take his name off it, you take my name off it. And was she being an ally? Was she, what she was being was, well, one, a decent human being, a fantastic supporter of me. And she continues to be a fantastic supporter of me, I have to say. And so, yeah, it's that thing about what are the behaviours that you want? Did I, I didn't want Julia Higgins to leave the room with me and say, there, there, Tom, isn't that a shame that the world is homophobic? <laughs> what I wanted her to do was act in the situation where I was under attack. And that is what a powerful ally should always feel responsible to do. They should always feel, I have power in this space. I can step in here where this person doesn't have power on their behalf. I think that's a great um, point to leave on. I think we should probably move on to our, our local speakers now. But Tom, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, you speaking with us and answering some important and interesting questions. Uh, and yeah, we wish you a happy LGBTQIA plus STEM day. And, uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us. And so we, I understand you have to leave us now. But well, really I, sh I shall hang on for as long as I can listening, uh, but I will need to leave before the end of the event. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of um, your LGBT plus in STEM day. And yeah, good night. Thank you.